Why is it so difficult to land a software engineering job? Well, in this video, I want to break down the truth about the software engineering job market and talk about what you can actually do about it if you want to land a job. Now, for a bit of context here, I've been working with about 100 students in a one-on-one -on -one capacity through my program, DevLunch. This has been over the past six months, and while we've had a lot of success landing students' jobs, it's not been easy. There's a lot of work that they need to do, there's a lot of refinements that we need to make, and even students that come in with a ton of experience at a senior software engineering level are still struggling before they get that guidance. They have a good resume, they have a good portfolio, you know, they have a good amount of experience in general, but when they apply, they're completely getting ghosted. They go in for a few interviews, no one ever calls them back, and they're kind of wondering, what the heck do I have to do to land this job, which is what I want to focus on in this video. Okay, so first, let's start with some observations about the market. Now, if we compare this back to the peak of the job market a few years ago when there was tons of jobs, everyone was hiring, it was super easy to get into tech, obviously, the market is completely different now. Employers are a lot more picky, they're not hiring as aggressively, we have layoffs coming, and software engineering is not as stable as a career as it used to be. That's just the reality of it. We can complain about it all we want, but in this video, I want to focus more on the solutions. Now, of course, we also have AI, right? That's scaring a lot of developers. A lot of companies aren't sure how much they should be hiring. It is replacing some developer roles, but it's really not gotten to that point yet, but it's definitely a factor. And then, of course, we have outsourcing, macroeconomics. There's a lot of things that are affecting the software developer industry. Now, with all of that said, this industry is still seeing some growth. Even though it doesn't feel like that, the amount of software engineering jobs is slowly ticking up after we had that large dip, you know, kind of during and after the pandemic. And I want to go through a few stats that are a little bit positive to give us some optimism and then talk about the strategies you can employ personally if you want to succeed in this market. The first stat I have is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and this projects that in the United States, employment for software developers, quality assurance analysts, and test will grow about 15% from 2024 to 2034, so in 10 years, which is much faster than the average for all other occupations. Now, that's about 130,000 job openings per year on average from both growth and then replacement needs. Now, another stat I have comes from iTransition, and similarly, they put the growth for software developers and other related roles at 17% from 2023 to 2033, forecasting about 327,000 new jobs in that span. Now, there's a lot of other stats that we could go through, but generally speaking, the market is growing. It's not a massive, crazy, aggressive growth, but compared to a lot of other industries, it is still quite healthy. It's not something that I think we should be too concerned with in terms of the number of jobs. Most likely, the reason you can't get a job isn't because there's enough of them. It's because you're making a mistake when you're applying, and that's what we'll get into now. Okay, so the first thing that I want to talk about here is niche. Now, a few years ago, when you were applying for developer jobs, it was relatively easy to get a job, even if you didn't have the exact tech stack that a company needed, and you were more of a general developer. You could put together a resume, and you could have Java, and C++, and Python, and a little bit of machine learning, and kind of skills all over the place, and show that you're well-rounded, that you know how to learn and adapt, and you could probably land a job if you could pass some of the interviews, right? Today, that's really not the case. Because companies are completely flooded with applicants, especially with all the AI applying and all the stuff that's going on, they're being extremely picky in the people that they even bring in for interviews. They're looking for people that are experts in a super specific niche. And I'm gonna give you some examples of this because I actually just had a conversation with a senior technical recruiter at Uber. We actually just hired her in DevLaunch to help our students. And the number one thing that she told me is that today you need to be a niche expert. Your resume and profile needs to be extremely tailored. You have to be someone who stands out as a really, really good fit for this particular role, not someone who could do the job. Now, we actually had a student who joined DevLaunch, and I was asking him during our initial call, okay, how's your interviewing been going? You know, how have the applications been going? And he told me he applied to about 20 companies, and he received about 10 interviews. Now, that's a pretty shocking response rate, considering most of you watching this video probably get a 1% response rate. And I asked him, how did you do that? Like, that's pretty phenomenal. How are you getting such a high response rate? And he told me, well, you know, I used to work in a self-driving car company, kind of a startup in San Francisco. So I've only been applying to self-driving robotic, you know, tech companies in San Francisco. I said, oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then when I looked at his resume, it's all tailored to that exact type of role. So that's the level of specificity that I'm talking about here. You can't be a general React dev or a general backend dev. You need to be really good in a specific tech stack. And then if you can go even further within a specific industry. 
For example, we had another student, Yusuf, he had a lot of banking knowledge, so we tailored his resume to finance, right? It's like tech finance, so he wants to be a software developer, but for a finance company. That worked wonders, you got a bunch of interviews, same thing with a bunch of other students. So if you're watching this and you don't currently have a niche, and when I read your resume, it's not apparent to me immediately what type of developer you are, then you're making a mistake and you're sending out a lot of applications that are never even getting looked at. So moral of the story here, you need to be really specific in the companies that you're targeting. You need to target a specific tech stack and type of development. You can't be applying to front end, a back end, and full stack, and AI, and ML. You need to pick one area and then dive as deep as you possibly can within a specific industry so that you really stand out. I know it seems like there's less jobs that will apply to you, but I promise you that is gonna make a big difference and actually get a lot of your applications seen. Now the next topic that I wanna dive into here is applying. Now essentially most of you watching this video have no strategy when it comes to applying. You're just spraying and praying, you're sending out a bunch of random interviews, and you're kind of just hoping that you get like selected for the lottery, that you get brought in for an interview, and you somehow are able to pass that when you've applied to every single software engineering job that exists under the sun. Now that obviously is not a good approach. Even if that volume gets you some interviews, it really is not gonna be effective because you can't prepare for every type of job that exists out there, right? If I apply to back end, front end, AI, full stack, there's no way that I can be prepared for all of those types of interviews. So you need to be a lot more targeted in your approach. Once you've determined your niche, you need to apply much more strategically to jobs that actually fit your profile. Right, where you're looking at this job, you're comparing it against your resume, and you actually do have most of the skills that are there. It doesn't mean you can't apply to things that are a little bit outside of your domain, but generally speaking, if you are a back-end Java developer, you shouldn't be applying to a random C++ role or to a Python ML role, even if you did a little bit of Python back when you were in university. Hopefully you get what I'm saying. Now, in order to be more strategic here, I highly recommend tailoring your resume to every application that you send out. It doesn't need to take a long time. Simply changing the professional summary, making some very small adjustments does make a big difference. But what really obviously takes it to the next level is if you can get a real human being to review your profile. Now, the best way to do that is with some kind of referral. It's not easy to generate a, refer a referral, sorry. You typically need to know someone or do some networking. So if you're not able to do that, then what you need to do is try to reach out to the hiring manager on LinkedIn. Now, for a lot of these jobs, it's not extremely difficult to find who's actually hiring and to get in touch with recruiters. For example, like I mentioned, we literally just hired a senior technical recruiter at Uber. She's working for DevLaunch. You could have just connected with her on LinkedIn, sent her a good cold DM message, and she's probably gonna at least see it, right? So that's the same thing with all of these recruiters that are hiring for all of these different jobs. You need to find them, reach out to them, send some kind of message, and even if you only get a 10% response rate from that, at least you're getting someone to actually look at your profile and you're generating a relationship and an opportunity that could lead to a job. Now, bluntly, I know that most of you watching this video are not gonna do that. You're gonna hear that, you're gonna say, oh, it's advice I've heard before, it doesn't work because you did it three times and no one replied to you, and you're just gonna go and continue doing the same thing. That's completely fine, but that's also exactly why this strategy still works because so few people actually do it. It's something we focus on a lot in our program. We teach you exactly how to do it. If you want a full video breaking down how to find the hiring manager and how to reach out to them, let me know and I'm happy to make that. And if you want immediate assistance with your application process, feel free to book a call with my team from the link in the description and we'll see if you're a good fit to join the program. Regardless, that's what you need to do when it comes out to apply. You need to just get people to actually look at your resume and do that in any way that you possibly can. Have the best LinkedIn possible, have the best resume possible, tailor the resume, try to get referrals if you can. If you can't, then try to network or at least reach out to the recruiters and hiring managers on LinkedIn, send a cold DM message, and I guarantee you will get a higher response rate there, and you're actually doing something actively to help yourself rather than just sitting back, praying, and essentially trying to win the lottery out of the 10,000 applicants that apply to a single job. Now, the next topic to get into is interviewing. Now, we can generate as many opportunities as we want, but if you cannot pass an interview, then you are not going to land a job. So I wanna to talk to you about essentially how to prepare for interviews and what the smartest strategy is. Now, obviously, for every type of job, you can expect a different type of interview route. If you're applying for a big tech company, expect that you're gonna get very heavy data structures and algorithms types questions. If you're going for mid to senior level roles, you're gonna get asked some type of system design. And then in all of these roles, you're probably gonna have some type of recruiter screen or kind of behavioral questions. Objectively speaking, the behavioral round is the easiest one to pass. However, 
You need to be confident, clear, and concise in your answers, which bluntly, a lot of developers really need to work on. So the first thing I would advise to all of you is practice answering interview questions out loud. Okay, create a simple list of all of the interview questions that are super popular, right? What's your biggest strength? What's your biggest weakness? Tell me about a time you worked on a team. Tell me about a time you took initiative for a project. Whatever, you guys know these, you can go ask ChatGPT. And for every single one of those questions, practice answering them out loud using the STAR method, right? Situation, task, action, and then result, okay? And for these, I would highly recommend writing down a super simple kind of bullet pointed script of how you would answer that question so you can rehearse it and be really well prepared when you do get asked these questions in an interview. For example, tell me about yourself. That's something that you need to be able to answer extremely concisely and you know that it's gonna come up, so there's no excuse not to be prepared for it. That's the behavioral round. Then we get to the technical round. Now for the technical round, I would highly suggest being intelligent where you're spending your time and making sure that you're preparing for the technical round you're likely going to receive. Now, if you're applying to startups, for example, it's unlikely that you're gonna get asked a data structures and algorithm type question. If you're applying to big tech, you know that that's gonna come up. If you're applying to a mid-sized company, it's more likely you're gonna get asked something practical where you go into an interview and you actually have to like design a React component or like build a simple API in Python or something along those lines. So first, understand what the interview is likely going to be. Obviously, you don't always know, but you can make an educated guess and then create your prep plan based on that. I highly recommend that even if you're a few months out from potentially having an interview, that you're consistently preparing by writing code every single day and doing some type of mini problems or DSA questions if that's something that's likely going to come up. It's a lot easier to just always be prepared in this kind of job search than it is to cram and try to prepare two or three weeks before you get an interview. It's much more relaxing, you feel a lot more at ease, you don't have to put in a ton of work and exhaust yourself before the interviews, and you already have a lot of that groundwork done, and then you can ramp up the preparation when you know that an opportunity is coming up. Again, this is exactly what we do with students at DevLaunch. We analyze their profile, we pick the niche, we refine all of their resume and LinkedIn, we start applying strategically, and then when we're generating opportunities, we've already done the preparation based on what we know is likely to come up. Okay, so that's kind of how I would do the prep. It's harder for me to give you a you know super specific prep roadmap on everything you need to do for interviews, but generally you need to know your stuff, you need to be fluent writing code because you almost certainly are gonna have to do some type of live coding, you need to be able to communicate well, and overall just not be awkward and be someone who's friendly that someone would actually want to work with. I'd say generally just preparing early and often is gonna make you a lot less nervous, which is what actually really fails a lot of people in these interviews, and it's to allow you to walk in with a lot more confidence because you actually know your stuff. So be smart with your preparation. Don't waste time doing a bunch of stuff that's not likely gonna come up. Again, if you tell me you're targeting a startup, we're not gonna spend three months working on LeetCode questions, but if you want a job at Google, that's pretty much all you need to focus on because you just need to pass a bunch of technical questions, right? Some type of system design interview and then a behavioral round. So study, understand what you're actually likely coming up against, prepare for those types of interviews and do it early and often. Now, the last quick topic that I wanna to discuss is AI and specifically how you should use AI in your preparation and in your job search. Now, sure, AI is something that people are scared of, right? They think it's gonna replace their job, but as a developer, it's a very powerful tool. However, you need to be very, very careful using this when you are prepping for jobs. I personally have conducted a lot of mock interviews and I brought people in and I always put them in a code editor environment and essentially asked them to just start writing code. The interviews I typically give are a lot more practical and I can notice immediately if someone actually knows how to code with their own fingers on the keyboard or if they simply have been using AI to do all of their work. That's because some people that are even senior level software engineers, believe it or not, quite literally do not remember the syntax to a for loop. They don't know how to define a class. They tell me that C++, for example, is their main programming language, and when I ask them a basic question about it, they simply do not know. So if you are preparing for interviews, it's extremely important, important sorry, that you're very fluent in your coding ability. Again, it's gonna show immediately when you're in any kind of live coding environment, even if you have to do it on the whiteboard. So you need to know and have memorized the basic syntax of the language and be able to demonstrate that you're actually comfortable working in the language that you say that you're an expert in. So just keep that in mind. You can use AI to quiz you, you know, help you find bugs, help you with projects, etc. But I would highly recommend not using it for mass code generation and making sure that you are actually putting in the reps of writing thousands of lines of code because that's overall how you get good as a developer.
Now, if you've stuck around until the end of the video, I can tell that you value education and improving day by day. Pretty much the only people that make it this far in YouTube videos, especially of this type of content, have that kind of mindset, right? They want to improve, they actually want to take some action. Now, that's why I want to share with you a fantastic resource that you can take advantage of, and that's Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Now, Brilliant is where you learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. They adopt a first principles approach, ensuring you understand the why behind each concept. Every lesson is interactive, engaging you in hands-on problem solving, which has proven to be six times more effective than simply watching lectures. The content is developed by top-notch educators, researchers, and professionals from renowned institutions like MIT, Caltech, and Google. Brilliant emphasizes enhancing your critical thinking abilities through active problem solving rather than memorization. As you learn specific subjects, you're simultaneously training your mind to think more effectively. Now, consistent daily learning is crucial and Brilliant makes it effortless with their bite-sized lessons, allowing you to acquire meaningful knowledge in just a few minutes each day. It's perfect for replacing idle screen time. Additionally, Brilliant offers a comprehensive range of computer science and Python courses, as well as extensive AI workshops guiding you from a complete beginner to an expert through practical hands-on lessons. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash techwithtim, scan the QR code on screen, or click the link in the description. Brilliant's also given our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant.